You can't say, well, I sort of like the God of the New Testament, but I'm not really comfortable with the God of the Old Testament. John wants you to know that Jesus and the Father are one. Well, we're returning to our study of the Gospel of John that will take us throughout this, this year. And as we do that, I want to keep referring to John's purpose for writing what he wrote. Uh, you find that in John 20. Now Jesus did many thing, many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Now listen to this. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That you would believe that Jesus is who John declares him to be and that you will have life because of that. Now the first two chapters of John are written to establish for us the identity and mission of Jesus. And we come to chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. Let me read for you. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. John wants you to know that Jesus came to do what the law could never do for you. The big question of these early chapters of John is, who is Jesus and how does he fit into the Father's great, covenantal plan. And that's what these verses are about. In contrasting the law and grace, John is not saying that the law of Moses was a bad thing. In fact, the law was the gift of God's love for his people. Think about when the law was given. It was never given as a means of achieving favor with God. Because when the law is given, God had already placed his love on his children and had redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt. No, the law was given to his people because they had no idea how to live. It revealed God's holiness and his righteous requirements for his children. The law is magnificent and detailed, reach into every area of life. It is proof of how much God loves his children and wants them to know him and to thrive. But here's what's important about this passage. The law has limits. Let me say it again. The law has limits. It does not have the power to rescue you from you and create in you a new heart. That alone is the work of grace. And because that is true, Jesus had to come. He had to live that perfectly righteous life. He had to die that acceptable death. He had to rise again, conquering sin and death. He had to ascend to the right hand of the Father. It's right to say that Jesus is the grace of God in the flesh. Maybe the way to say it is grace has a name and its name is Jesus. I like what the passage says here about, uh, it says, we have received from him grace upon grace. Uh, that's a bit of a hint that the work of God's grace is not an event, it's a process. And that means that you and I need the grace of God today as much as we needed it the first day that we believed. God's grace is an inexhaustible supply of mercy for all who believe. The final thing that this passage tells us is that Jesus was sent to earth as the ultimate revelation of who God is. Jesus came to make his Father known. You can't say, well, I sort of like the God of the New Testament, but I'm not really comfortable with the God of the Old Testament. 
John wants you to know that Jesus and the Father are one. One in nature, one in character, and one in purpose. The Father of grace sends the Son of grace to make his grace known. And that is very, very good news. Thank you.